to this first of what I hope will become a series of Molly Bloom readings, I'd be thrilled, I mean, amazed really, to be able to bring together such a gathering of friends and poets for reading anywhere in the real world. So that's clearly a bonus for this virtual environment. On the other hand, as with any good poetry gathering, wedding or funeral, I suppose, there are more people <laughs> here that I'd love to have a drink or a meal with afterwards than would be possible, even if we were all in the same place. As it is, I'm here in Suffolk. Maria Stadnitska, who I'll introduce in a moment, is in Gloucestershire, and Kelvin Corkins at home in Brussels. And you're all, wherever you are, about to enjoy what I trust will be a memorable reading. For those who may not know, I'm Aidan Simmons, um, editor of Molly Bloom magazine, and Maria and Kelvin, apart from having both made a number of appearances in Molly, are two of my absolute favourite poets as well as giving considerable inspiration and support to my own writing, for which I am extremely grateful. It's fair to say that the book I'll be reading from later, which is There Will Be Singing, um, would not be quite what it is without the encouragement and gentle advice from those two. So it seemed appropriate from my point of view that I should have them along as my collaborators on this first Molly Bloom reading. And I count myself very privileged to be launching it in their company. Three years ago, at the wonderful Tears in the Fence Festival in Deepest Dorset, um, thank you for that, David Caddy, who I think is with us tonight, um, I chanced upon myself sitting next to a woman who at that point I'd neither met nor heard of, but we got chatting, as you do in pauses at such events, found we had a very similar outlook on the world and on poetry, swapped copies of our then new books, and that was my introduction to Maria Stadnitska. By the end of that weekend, having read and heard her read some of her work, I was definitely a fan. Um, of Romanian Italian parentage, brought up in Romania and Ukraine, and for most of her adult life living, working and studying in England, Maria brings a unique cultural and linguistic sensibility to work that I can't imagine being produced by anyone else. No one else blends the personal and political, social and surreal, in quite the way she does. A product, no doubt, of being able to think in a number of languages and the gaps and translations between those languages, but also of her own very individual eye and ear. That tireless reviewer Steve Spence has described it as a lyric voice which is enveloped in a darkly surreal context, and well, that seems exactly right. Her book Somnia was to me the most inspiring book of the past year. So over to you, Maria. Thank you. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. At least uh, 400 I heard, so that's good feedback. But um, I do feel like I'm talking to myself most of the time. So I will pretend I'm not uh, nervous, although no matter how many times you've done readings, um, how many times you've presented, uh, I worked in news uh, for several years and I always have nerves when I read. And I am so grateful to all of you for joining us. And um, Bear, it is an amazing day today. And um, I thought, well, why not? Because um, we're having a hurricane, well, almost a hurricane here in uh, Gloucestershire. Start with a poem that more or less opens my latest book, Somnia, uh, entitled Witness. At the supermarket's meat counter, they sell ropes, yellow and blue. Things we need when weather turns bad. One could never be sure when the boat needs time off to a cleat. At checkout, we talk of Hurricane Ursula. It was in the news. It is now by the docks. My bottled green sea is resting on shelves. Across the aisle, a woman looks out. Trains deliver milk and morning newspapers. At the end of his shift, a night watchman lights a cigarette, watching Umbrella running to shelter. He has nowhere else. His children sent him a blank telegram. Monochrome wins, he thinks. Time to repair, to build. The house he was born in no longer exists. 
Now, as I've been talking about cues, here is another poem about cues, but also about chess. I'm not sure if any of you like chess or play chess. When I grew up in Romania, um, chess was a big thing. And the only way to kind of um, show that you are worth something uh, was to maybe prove that you are good at chess. So I grew up wanting to be um, a world champion. <laughs> And this poem uh, is about cues, but also it is about a chess game that took, took place um, in 2004 between uh, Gary Kasparov and the Ukrainian Russian Ponomoryov. And after that game, uh, Kasparov lost his world championship, but also he decided to retire from chess. And one of the reasons why he decided that was that he accused Ponomoryov, so his opponent, uh, of cheating. And the reason for that was Ponomoryov kept on his mobile phone on and the mobile phone kept on ringing whilst they were playing. Let's see. Unrest. If you keep still for too long in queue at the supermarket, there comes a point when you look behind and see nobody else. Everybody kept moving closer to checkouts got their rations and left happy. This is what happened to Kasparov in 2004 when Ponomoryov decided to go ahead, ignore the security protocol and break castling rules. He won a million dollars and the championship. Kasparov stared at the chessboard in the grand arena until closing time. The manager asked him to go home. It happens to all heroes she said, locking up. On Mondays, I wear fundamental black for patient beginnings and drink to my demolished house. My killer instinct becomes a harp playing to little beings. I am a dog reaching its hermit age, C-shaped bones chasing after me in a playground with rusty swings. My love, we don't end up in paradise. We keep moving. We stop halfway a bridge to witness the birth of new cities. My fangs check rising buildings for bad omens. A dog must consider all possibilities before the game has even begun. Running late. If you live by water, and feel hungry, it takes an afternoon of chewing yesterday's leftovers to taste mud on your tongue. Thankful when a passerby gives you a bad apple. Neighbors say the well-wisher is God running late to a meeting in the nearby mansion. We should spat the rot back at him. Too late, the meeting it rushed to would carry on and on for as long as your life. Domestication. Thank you for calling our service. You are fifth in the queue. An operator will be with you shortly. In the meantime, watch the beasts in our zoo through a keyhole. Please observe safety precautions and remain in your vehicle. A lion born in captivity has recently been reported missing. Thank you for calling our service. You are fourth in the queue. Apologies for the delay. All our operators are busy at present. We are experiencing unexpected disruption. Someone will be with you shortly. For information in your language, access online, tutorials. Thank you for calling our service. You are third in the queue. The operators here shouting, screaming outside the call center. High alert. Please remain in your vehicle. Lock the doors. The client's welfare is very important except in emergency situations when staff come first. To survive the jungle you have to become animal. Thank you for calling our service. 
you are second in the queue. All our operators are dealing with our serious incident. We are sorry for this inconvenience. The background music contains sounds which you might find distressing. Press zero to return to the main menu. Press one to continue listening. Thank you for calling our service. You are next. Have your bank details ready. Bear with us. Someone will be with you as soon as possible. To listen to these options, again, press star. To keep on, please hold. You are next. You are Good morning. Sorry to keep you waiting. You are through to the Samaritans. How can we help you today? And now here comes an inevitable lockdown poem. The Mechanics of Pencils. This poem is inspired by a letter that the, author, the artist um, Ai Weiwei has sent to his child when he returned from um, uh, prison. 6.30, my day grows smalled on corridors leading to shower blocks. On foot in my room, I measure space in back and forth steps. Movement along tiled floors square the symmetry between guards and me. 7.40, bread time, then one hour of exercise repetitive pacing during change of guards. Their bones click in position, the same place as yesterday. 11, daytime interrogation. Ahead of a compliance practice, I write down my faults with the mechanical rigor of a loaded handgun. Exercise break. Confined to my spot, I touch shades imprisoned between bricks, crushed to the size of my thoughts. Second round of interrogations before 5 p.m. dinner. Hours with knife edge creases trample over my neck, carve my name in words without vowels. Night cleans my fingers and eyes of things felt and seen during the day. Next to my bed, soldiers on duty check their watches. They too run on the spot, bound to their movements. Urban afterlife. After a funeral, paperwork sits in boxes at the end of desk rows. Undertakers pause to change suits before shift handover. Diesel engines flatten down places of rest. Glass, iron, gravel. Machines know. Cities grow in negative spaces. Oil traces gift buildings with signs of the cross. Gliding hawks operate traffic for clear passage. Night drops its guard. Machines argue. Power cuts add imagination to people's life. So much for ending day's work, seeking dawn. Turning. It takes one day to build a city on greasy oil patches. A lifetime to keep its beat and the clean duvet covers. Fear of dirt lifts high fences. Cyanide marks the curb where someone drops coins to a local beggar. Pitch black. Time to adjust the heat in our pressure cookers. Kneel down and burst into song for a moment. Day of reckoning hour of grace before the fates turning. Church bells melt at the hands of those who pray too much. Late afternoon, noise settles in tower clocks. God begs not to let it be. 
a washout. And my final poem, Unearthing. Wash your hands, they say, after a day in the fields. A daughter with soiled dress must clean her shame. My preparation foretells starched days in rooms where everyone wears masks. Impossible to tell who teachers are. Forthcoming lessons surrendered to hunger at the back of a classroom. Bound to kinship. Black flats passed down to barefoot offspring. Poverty chooses its bloodline with the same care stalks roost in the tallest houses. Safe nests. Look for weeds in mid meadows. But when I bring home seeds under my fingernails, they run the top, scold my hands raw. Blisters grow over my lifeline. The elders bow to their fear. As in Latin, timere is being afraid of unearthing aging blades. School days on hands and knees. My son and daughter, born in mid-meadows, raise their palms high at the back. Clean wounds face forward to honor their birthright. Thank you for listening. <laughs> I'm so pleased <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> wow, it's done. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous reading, Maria, thank you. Thank you for having me. And let's not forget why we are here. Uh, we are here for Aiden. Uh, I know that when I, I met Aidan, and for many years after that, I used to call him um, Aidan. Uh, and that was my way of um, saying, well, your name is a bit like um, an opera character. But something that makes me so proud to be here tonight is the fact that uh, Aidan is maybe the only person that I've met, the only writer, British writer that I've met um, in 17 years of being here that without any reserve has been there to support me in very difficult moments of self-doubt and also uh, having that generosity of supporting another poet in his work is one of them the gifts that um, are very precious uh, and valuable in in this day and age and I, I'm really really grateful for this friendship and, and the fact that you've you know you supported my works so far now about Aiden well uh, it is um, there is so much to say but Aiden uh, is so much younger than me born in 1957 <laughs> in um, Herefordshire uh, and he grew up in Herefordshire and Durham and um, He's the only stage school product reading English in his year at um, Trinity College, Cambridge. He, whilst he was there, uh, Aidan was the chair of the Poetry Society and also he co-edited with uh, Peter Robinson four issues of the poetry magazine Perfect Bound. In 1978, he won the Chancellor's Medal for an English poem the winning poem is revisited in the book they will be singing and the winning this poem has got a change name the strange geometry we all know that aiden is the founder of molly bloom and initially the magazine was in print now from the mid 80s and early 2000s he's dropped out of poetry altogether and the magazine went online and a very interesting um, fact about Aidan is that between her, um, his first pamphlet and his first full-length book, uh, 33 years past, his first book, A Stone Dog, was published by Schussmann in 2011. Uh, and I did check online. The first 
a pamphlet published by Aiden uh, is still available to buy for £73 <laughs> if you are interested. Um, he has given readings in Cambridge, Durham, London, Bedford, uh, in Suffolk, uh, Star Payton in Berlin, and he's been published in many magazines over the, five, five, the last uh, 50 years. Also, he has been a sub-editor of the News of the World, The Independent, Daily Mirror, uh, as well as working for several regional papers and writing on football for The Independent, Evening Standard and The Guardian. Aiden's shortest career has been in politics. Maybe not everybody knows that just over a year ago, uh, Aiden was elected as a local councillor for the Green Party. Am I right? Was it the Green Party? You are right, I've now quit. <laughs> yes, you've just stood down for this position uh, to spend more time with your writing, which is amazing. Um, I mean, yes, you could have helped and supported our communities through your political career, but I, I find that your writing career um, is, is very, very important. And, um, I think it's, it's so good to hear you say that you're going to dedicate more time to this. Now, I'm really, really happy to have read the book, an amazing um, new collection, They Will Be Singing. Isn't it funny in, in a pandemic that we're experiencing at the moment? It, it feels that even singing is forbidden for fear of spreading germs. How lucky are we to be here online and we can sing as much as we want because nobody's gonna catch anything. So I give you uh, Aidan um, to read to us from his latest book, They Will Be Singing. Thank you, Maria. That's all lovely and sweet of you. Um, I fear this reading could develop into a sort of a um, mutual appreciation society. I hope it doesn't come over as too sickening in that way. But anyway, Calvin has spoken yes. very kindly somewhere about the way my poetry moves in the personal, the political and the historical, as of course does his own. In fact, I think that's something all three of us reading tonight share in different ways. Um, this new book that they will be singing, which Maria has just shown you, um, some of which I'm going to share with you now, um, continues the engagement with the political that's marked my work up to now, but also contains much more of the personal than before. But I'm going to begin with a, something of the political and historical, and this first one I'm going to dedicate tonight to Brian Marley, the People's Welfare Typewriter calls upon you to imagine Sisyphus happy. Imagine tulips, codfish, coffee. Imagine the fervour of the early typists. Thoughts travel the roads that writing makes, or so they say. It's said that language limits thought, words and signs unreadable in an incompatible country. Begin then by studying railways or the keys that shine with use. Emigrant, far away, urgent, longing, Hardship, dream, typists more than anyone must follow the times. Work made free. We eat lunch in a restaurant close to the industrial area, menu and prices aimed carefully at a new managerial class. Videos of the funeral cortege repeat endlessly behind the diners' heads in a porcelain white environment of cutlery and chairs. The queen in this story is a malnourished child, the same fly permanently buzzing about her lip sores and tarnished tiara. There is a chicken loose in the chocolate factory, entrails spilling from its ravaged arse among the cocoa solids. They're all in special economic zones, old refurbished buildings from a communist era, jobs traded on the out-of-stock exchange, nodes in the global supply chain. Factories on the flat horizon mark the land, crumbling brickwork shedding plaster in buildings where pot plants tower over TV sets. Shadowy workers whose homes remain always just out of shot start with a live chicken and it comes out minutes later in trays with little skill and plastic film applied. Intruders on their own land displaced by state creation. The border's not much higher than a farmyard fence. Priests on one side, penitents on the other. Theorists of borderlessness and market regulation say the wall is the will of the people. From a distance, trompe l'oeil gaps invite you through. 
slogans above the entranceway, work, have fun, and live safely, etched in the glass. We are all connected through joy. For his bad verses. In every small apocalypse, on every silver screen, in low res monochrome footage from street corner cameras, we see at several angles the death of Sinner the poet. How his clothes are torn, his glasses crushed, his hair pulled, lips and eyes ripped, eyes gouged, genitals despoiled, limbs wrenched apart by unmercy of the riot. Hungry, angry wants, both legitimate and illegitimate, democratically unmet, turned furiously on the innocent. How the yellow jackets clamour and rebel for misplaced cause. How we are gripped in a tidal swamp of our own incontinent piss. How we elect our own demise. How nothing is as we believed. How the city and the forest burn. How the world and the worm turn. Armistice Day. The leaves have been late to turn hanging on for the next big storm, blackberries still on the bush in November. Bemeddled gents in well-shined shoes strut and shout around the town, playing soldiers for charity, while boys in uniform hide in the churchyard to set off fireworks in lieu of guns at 11. Another boarded up shop appears in the award-nominated high street. Four months to go and still you don't know where you're going. What would it? What will it? The past devours the future. Not what is the trouble, but what seems to be. What's to become of us all, enthralled to the fetish of complex cross-border supply chains and just-in-time delivery? A hardening of borders and arteries, a physical manifestation promising the end of welfare as we know it. A moral responsibility to children, husbands, the church, the bank. His goodness, the vice regent, planning the great dissolution, plots the dismantling of old institutions and how it will enrich the elite. 29 miles of leaked local government reports, pending agreements and negotiations. On the make, currying favour while ensuring a pile and a name for himself. Visions of medicine and care, sex, family and the body. White guilds of destroying angel by the path behind the house. Firms face collateral damage, new administrative burdens, market access to developing countries, agriculture tariffs are very high, bargaining power reduced. There are limits to what we can do. Family structures under strain conform to norms to make things worse. Structural changes to government revenue in the global economy, access abroad and all that jazz returned to negative growth. Permanent reduction of output, changes abrupt and volatile, disruption inevitable like the night the pound plummeted. Places like Aberdeen and London face increases in perceived downside risk, but smaller negative effects, still difficult to adjust. Avoid cross-border leakage, delays in access to medical supplies, international markets where angry exports go, no safety net for airlines, a shortage of workers exposes local farmers. Hippies and activists are brought into line by debt, freedom to invent yourself bought by inherited wealth. A thousand new statutory instruments where the value of capital rises faster than wages, trashes the meritocratic vision. Dependency and care are family matters. Locked in the bedroom tax of austerity, what interest must be paid to the bank of mum and dad? There must be a word for experiments in faith-based welfare. Effective altruism, entrepreneurship and community as such strange alliances emerge. Moral logistics become imperatives in a place where anything may be defined as capital. The future dividend perhaps of a good night out with friends. In the end, whose generals would you rather trust if you truly had a choice? Life goes on, but perhaps it's going nowhere in particular, nowhere to be seen. Crime become an act of charity or charity, a crime. You might have got some sort of sense of my feelings about Brexit and our government from that. I don't know, you might choose to read it that way. So I'm gonna turn now from that overtly political stuff to something more personal. The last section of There Will Be Singing is certainly my most autobiographical work to date. And this first one I'm going to uh, read from that section um, sprang from Maria's line that you heard a bit earlier about a house that's no longer there. Um, I haven't actually seen my own birthplace since I was four, so there's a bit of research and a bit of imagination behind this, but 
I think it's broadly true and it's certainly true in spirit. Halifax Road. The house I was born in still stands between the moor top and the village wreck. The open moor where curlews call, the swings where my sisters took me to play. The patch of rough garden where my brother sank a pit for a wooden moon rocket. The house I was born in was built with his own hands by a weaver newly returned from the war. The war against Napoleon and revolutionary France, so he could settle and marry his sweetheart. The couple who sold the house to my parents remembered as children knowing that old man. The house I was born in still looks out over the valley, no longer smoky, but still twinkling at night with the lights of the old mill town, where that weaver's cloth was traded and the bus from the village ran. Stand today by the once lonely house, and only when the wind howls loudest will you lose the background sound of tyres on tarmac and engines growl, from the fuming traffic in people and freight moving along that scratch on the map scrawled between cities whose nighttime glow looms and glowers over the open moor. There are three pieces in, in this book that I call palimpsests. They all play on words written by Maria Stavnitska and Jessica Mukherjee in a bout of online sharing and collaboration that we had in the early days of the Brexit and Nanities. I think, I think all three of us have made some use in our individual books of some of the pieces that collaboration engendered such as the poem you've just heard and the Armistice Day piece I read before it. Um, anyway, this is Palimpsest 3, with many thanks um, really to Maria and, and Jess. I'm wearing the wrong shoes. These were undoubtedly never my father's. The wolves will be offended, the news unconscionable. We will be folded and submerged, coming home late, baffled by astrological predictions. It's weird, dear, almost verbally at the beginning, how terrible was his face, wearing clothes around the garden so innocently. Interested in torn up history and walking towards a war that insists on its own righteousness. The talks are locked in stalemate, a bishop maintaining silence while pawns threaten your queen. How eager some of us are to dominate the laughing dead, There's this softness in calm barrels. Silent war reduces its prison and cools the ice. We were made in the blood cr cluster bars of the prayer book and then falling asleep to support the sharp sword of afternoon near the poles. A map found in a charity store talking in more than one voice. This voice reveals the curfew intelligence of a clock. Break open the book. There is no electricity, no lunch breaks. There should be fresh polish, hot water and other single dreams. But it is only a voice that stands out while talking to us. Thy crime maps will be done. Day Trip, 1978, and this harks back to student experience and some includes some words I wrote then. I eat an apple as if it was an ice cream, and my ice cream as if it were an apple. I am still here for now. Coloured lighting bends into the sky and back, reflected in the rain. Advertising slogans projected on the clouds as voices quiver between the buildings, rippling in the water's surface. Visions affected, dreamlike, refracting images of fear, falling on sculpted stonework and blades of the lawn we lie on. The enclosing sky and dim shadows just out of sight. Fear of returning to normalcy, where all will be changed, fear of not. Puzzlement of how a perceiver relates to these perceptions. They will believe I imagined I could fly or intended self-annihilation. But it is only that the lawn is so green and near I could step out onto it. Now dank hours must follow, and we subside into our words. Maria referred earlier when she was introducing me to a, a reworking of the poem which earned me the 1978 Cambridge Chancellor's Medal. This is it. That strange geometry. After all these forty summers, her face, now powder white, interrupts his nights. Her cold white face bandied everywhere before him as he roams his little world, swinging between crutches. Some stories up, she descends into hell, or is it escape, by the beckoning frame of a window. 
Here then is the story, every story there is, the door hinged to open either way. She is no ghost, for time is not present or past, but is. Yes, a window, geometric aperture through which a woman, anyone, may make an exit. Restlessly, he moves along the arcane structures, the complexity set out by men. But was it the window he saw her face reflected in or staring blankly through? The windows polished and shone, the windows broken, shattered in the streets, leaving mannequins of their owners exposed, still, barefaced, blank. The trap does not spring shut, but closes slowly, irrevocably, impermeable. Where one's head is arranged at another's foot, he wandering must seem a malignant growth, yet with his calipers he goes among and between, quartering the planet. She leaves behind her a kerfuffle of papers as she takes her last exit through the high casement. Swerving in continuum, void, beyond and above, such a sphere is merely veering amid nothing, continuously, or time is only distance, movement, Light from the window behind him, caught in his glasses, makes bright points on the paper. Stoppage or continuation, departing or arrival, he lusts for climactic death. Night strangely holds him, but always the earth turns anew to the sunrise, and his numinous visions are sent back, diseased, to wherever they came from. She contemplates again the imperfection in the glass, that bubble where clouds wiggle. Should he select a door or wait for one to swing open in his direction? Seen from the bed, the window is the scene of all life, all activity of birds and neighbours, tradesfolk and the curious unknown. The strangest door is the one that closes silently behind him, leaving him surprised to find that all seems still the same about him. The same and not the same. And finally, um, my mother, who died in 2016, just short of her 95th birthday, was a well-informed, sharp and engaging conversationist right up until the few weeks before she died, and no doubt felt bitterly the effect of the ultimately fatal stroke, which made it very difficult for her to communicate. I spent a lot of time with her over her last few years, um, and put together this out of my notes of things she said or tried to say in those final frustrating few weeks. One. For days after day, from Wednesday through Afalunish, I climb the Mecca Verkali, swiffle and wishy, climb and climb. Feather most blueful flog it, blastle fog it to the high, high, and then learn or burble, cly and cly to did it and got glyph of a blueful furger, and I so proud of yourself, as you may imagine. Alvin to the Felgenstegel, trine and trine, cly and cly, cline in dream time, all in dream. Days in days water, blyffle spurgen to the Albanmeister, and drothel muster glingenmester, can you? Glogel muster, can you? Can you? I could spriffle most and hangenshunk, and so, to be honest with you, he glindle, wendle, handle, bindle, lendle, and so glindermandle, metal felicky, oh, the rattle popping, and can you? The Meister singer, and some tessel in smurgle, hip, heisig night, but may and may not keep clining in dream, can you? Get you, can you? Oh, smelly, spelly, some baldridge flash of puss, yes. Two. Bad tongue collapses, climmer clamour till November. Just wait till your father gets hope. She'll want to tessel the grave vonderheap till the cow comes, as courting of parents telefies, language domage jessifies in brain, as well you know. Three. I am too old. Tomorrow. I might be gone. I may, tomorrow. How is it possible for a person to forget their dearest names? It should be time for finish. I feel, I often feel, if someone would be so kind. So that's it from me. Um, 40 years ago, when I brought the original issue of Molly Bloom into the world, there it is, um, 
many of the contributors have been well-known names to anyone who might have been likely to pick it up. Um, E.A. Markham, Archie Markham, Peter Riley, Rosemary Waldrop, David Challoner, Lee Harwood, Gail Turnbull, Wendy Mulford. Among them, the name Kelvin Corcoran will have been unfamiliar to most. I think, and he might correct me, it was his first or second appearance in print. So well done me for recognising the quality of what I think may have been the only unsolicited manuscript that came my way for that debut issue. It was something like 30 years before we first met in person, by which time Kelvin had become one of the most hard-working and well-respected poets around, with a long list of publications to his name, including a selected poems in 2004, since when he's continued to publish at what seems an increasing rate and with increasing confidence. In 2014, at which point the book count stood at 14, apparently, he was the subject of a he hefty Kelvin Corcoran reader, edited by Andy Brown, I think he's with us tonight somewhere, um, and containing essays on Kelvin's work by such notables as Lee Harwood, John Hall, Simon Smith, also here tonight, and Luke Kennard. Ian Brinton has said he is at the forefront of contemporary poetry. Andy Brown says he can help us wake up through his writing. I'd agree with both. I'm not so sure about Martin Corliss Smith's statement that The Republic of Song, Kelvin's latest book, which he's about to read from, is Corcoran's Wasteland. In stature and significance, it may be that. Only time will tell for sure. There is a similar sense of the past, both real and mythical, speaking to the present, which is always front and centre with Kelvin's work. But Corcoran is a more politically astute figure than El Eliot ever was, with a deeper sense of realities, inanities and injustices. In a recent email, he described his own work and his own current state of mind as being preoccupied with the abhorrent and then looking away from it, not to be automatic in either direction. That is exactly right, I think. In fact, it sums up very well the common factor between the work you've heard so far from Maria and me and what you're about to hear from Kelvin. Um, the launch in London last year of his extraordinary life and near death revealing Shearsman pamphlet below this level was without a doubt the most emotionally affecting reading I've ever attended. So over to you, Kelvin. Thank you, Aidan. I'm assuming everybody can hear me. Yeah. Okay. You've stolen my introduction, Aidan. <laughs> By <laughs> the abhorrence. <laughs> so yeah. we'll go. Rude Ibu. To write a mythology commensurate to an ignorant island is not difficult. They were of that class of traitor, self-serving, unimaginative. Their only skill to make the poor vote for poverty, the preterite for abandonment. Oh, bury me quietly in Hardy's field. I perch my head in a bare room on Rue des Ibu. Dogs bark in French, ash and silver birch talk all night. Reynard at the rubbish on the tree darkened road. Europe at the corner. His delicate step, his nose in filth, by comparison is noble and not given to self-destruction. What in the shape of a cloud? A cloud in the shape of a cloud, in the shape of an imagined country adrift on the edge of a continent. It's doubtful, we've moved on from that since meteorology usurped portents. It disintegrates anyway. Thin as air, snagged on a fault mid-Atlantic. I like the high ones up there. Silver white capsules full of people, sun under their wings, gliding the trade routes, rising to the world, the many. I never thought I'd actually be reading that poem, Rude Ibu, from Rude Ibu, courtesy of COVID-19. But there you are. Um, uh, you, you can't find your way in the Republic of Song unless you look at abhorrence in the way um, Aidan's kindly mentioned for me. And, and at its opposite, um, 
to find it, poetry has to um, has to look at everything, has to sing about everything. I think the abhorrence and its opposite, without resorting to immediate or you know automatic response. Um, there's there's much even now which is undiminished by the present forms of degradation we're surrounded by and um, without holding on to those things we can't handle we've become enthralled to the degradation i think so this might be a complicated way of saying these poems are all over the place that i'm going to read to you um not only in tone and concerns and mood but also by location from here in Brussels to even briefly in France and parts of Greece and several parts of the UK. And um, just to uh, maintain this positive note, here is an inscription from Odysseus Elitis from Tonaxion Este to start the poem Radio Logos. Prepare yourself. Dog fuckers and corpse eaters and gloom addicts rule the future with excrement. It's not a headline I've seen in the newspaper, but every day it's there. Should I dance on the mouth music scales, meaning nothing, meaning valve dust? Why taunt the dumb beast? Well, this aside, you must listen to my morning broadcast. I've recharged the arcane batteries of Radio Logos. Stroke the air and rewire the marvels of Hellas. Do you like that tone? A little grandiose for you. Certainly not a song a cage eating its own droppings. Lesson one. Don't be a hired mouth or pundit. Lesson two. You must remember only archaeology is true. The invention of sailing. Recall the beauty of trade routes, but the meaning of unread inscriptions can change everything. Good. The valves are humming, the meters flicker, the dust burns. I tap, tap the microphone. You can hear me? You can hear these words remade on waves of morning air. Has the color of the sea broken your heart yet? The air in blue waves transformed your seeing. The bronze mountains turned your head, yes? So there's hope for you then. Listen, lesson three, there is no history that does not relate to the present. We know this. We know the cities that once were mighty, etc. They're nothing now but decrepit dormitories populated by the insular, the ignorant. Imagine a country shrinking into itself, terminal. The meaning of an unread binary choice has changed everything, a future unexamined. Picture an island slowly rowing to the America. The tinny islands go trumpety trump and sink in a fog of self-absorption as the princes pipe their old new tunes. Their country has played itself out. England has played itself out. I landed there, loaded with memory. It was a novelty dog show in the spring. The sun made arrows of every blade of grass. The hills folded into themselves, a miracle of green. And here they come the happy dog lovers in their camper vans, freedom, odyssey, rambler, grinning and panting like dogs to a tilted field. At the close, they dive into a sclerotic sea, buried under a regular sunset, hardly making a splash. 
taking the living with them. Thanatocracy. Your country has played itself out. No, those feet did not. Freedom, Odyssey, Rambler. This is the anti-Jerusalem. And um, the same place, but with a completely different vision. The same damn place. Part of a poem called The White Road. The Slad Valley is in Gloucestershire. And then I'm in West Cornwall. If I went back there, would I hear her voice and see those figures again, that side of the family, the other side of time folded in the blue and green hills of the Slad Valley as evening falls under luminous distance and they work out their lives, come and go, turn that field to better use, raise children, stop. There's a patch of light in the sky seems to pause and shed a painterly quality on common nativity. Picturing the practical, hard-bitten characters raising the fallen as if still walking long-legged over hedges, brimming ditches, taking the road to town with the blue-green valley at their backs alight. I see them come tramping over the fields, catch the rough old songs beating in their hearts. The boy dreamt of a white road. Night was all around, but the white road shone. He walked along it thinking it was death and everything said, no invention is allowed. Poetry was buried in the mud and muck of the ditch. He forgot its sound and wondered if it ever happened. The black trees bore the names of all the girls he'd known and the spaces between the things making sense enlarged. I would rather walk in the Atlantic light of Penwith. The tilting perspective painted by Ben Nicholson, spilling us east and west into the slapping sea as we teeter on Celtic fields, skate on granite hedges. Day recalls that village to the left of the lane, a bridge of sorts over the pell-mell stream and its aria. And a very small part of um, a poem called Come Up, Come Up from which I get my title. Lee Harwood um, hovers from time to time in this book. <laughs> um, a significant poet for many of us and good friend to many of us too. Come up, come up. At night I think of the living and the dead. The Irish songs rise like light over Carrick Fergus. And I lose my way on Grafton Street, heading out for the Republic of Song. In the Republic of Song, we're all walking. I see my father on the road from Wexford town. He survives the war and beats the drink. I see him now on the black road, turn about. Andy, let's walk along the cliffs, the turfy paths and rocks, step high across the rumours, the old epiphany spent, and fling the whole lot into the uncased Atlantic air 
with the spring dizzy fauna and every thought of art. The raptor, the drone, the water streaming from the hill. Let all the music of earth figure by terms the path we walk. Let the Victor Freeman, 20 miles off Wolf Rock, return safely to harbour and the sea settle its speech in the wake. We saw Lee set off westward over the unlikely blue wave. Mountaineer, poet, friend, restored to all tenderness. The good man Harwood, not waiting on pastoral rhapsody, sees everything, the history of dead men singing underground, the quick green one-time flash of the darting lizard, and the roll of the land overflowing to the final sea. In the Republic of Song, we're all walking. And you see us now on the black road turnabout. And um, through the magic of music, uh, um, we transport to Greece. At least it's easier than flying at the moment. And here is the thought of John Berriman playing the accordion. There was a choir later that night, alive, the many voices anonymous. John Berryman grinning played the accordion approximately, something broken from youth. Put the schlager back in the box, John Berryman said. I stand for difficulty, disclosure, rage. Next time around, I'll take up the accordion, he said. His genius for accelerated feeling restored. Later, there were musicians in the street, a young man, a young woman with mandolin and harp, as if at first only imagined and unplaced, more so traditional from many parts of Europe. The song held the air and hovered in doorways, making a pause in terrestrial motion. We walked to find the origin of the music within reach, and night came down gently, like the end of time. There are occasions in the world, restored to precise experience that perhaps were never there in the first place. Though everything of saying says, look, here at hand, you can walk into the center of the shape made by the sound. There was a dark horizon of mountains across the water. And I heard the first song broadcast on radio, Apollon. The ferry had left and there was nowhere else to go. And the waves ran under the key in exact measure. Um, this poem, The Bones of Them Are Keeping, there is singing at the end, and if you are so inclined, please join in. I won't hear you, I don't suppose, but I can imagine it. No. The Bones of Them Are Keeping. We climbed the Calderimi, Taitos above, let a yellow dog run and looked out for snakes. The sea, a bowl of light we're heading for. Across the square, an Eos Demetrius, a mulberry tree, catches the sunlight in its spreading branches, as if the light pours from the sprouting leaves. Give me your unfurling hand. I would take your hand. In that dance, the opposite of dying, as the vetch and daisies rise in a wave. The sky opens to magnify the earth incandescent. The sun, a path of broken glass on the other shore, a radiant scatter casts this way. A 
a quotation from a hotel guest book. Just beside, there is the Catholic Church with the friends of Greece. In the crypt, the bones of them are keeping. Lord Byron was a real friend of this country. This is the reason we call our hostelry by his name. Tonight, a crowd fills the square in Naflio for Good Friday. The bower of white and purple flowers for Jesus held aloft and purple banners for Jesus hanging from high windows. Priests, acolytes and big wigs on stage, but not a girl up there. The silver band plays in death march to lead the parade. Kiri eleison. And there's a baby in pink rabbit costume on my shoulder. Kiri eleison. And for one moment, everyone stops talking. Kiri eleison. And the shops dim their lights for the parade to pass. Let me join those families. Lose me in that crowd. The children grasp the strings of their ascendant balloons. The cartoon faces nod and genuflect above us all. Kiri ele zon with a thump on the big drum. And uh, some more Greek. Uh, this is the first part of a moment called Listening to Country Music, originally written to and for Denise, Denise Riley. I'm sending you this from Aegeus Demetrius. October light on the sea as summer retreats, the day strung out like amber beads of the turning world. We can walk along the shore and see its radiance dissolve. I can no more describe the light than walk on water. I hold everything, I hold nothing. But on sighting the sea, we shout, Thalassa, Thalassa, for the great enterprise. Catastrophe tops the brim. Saint Demetrius lives above the harbour, they say. I hear their singing, their octosyllabic meraloia. Another lit photograph fixed to a headstone another grave to feed and water to talk and talk to. And the rain will be good for the olives. Straight down spears of light falling on our heads. The sound of its descent rising like inescapable thought buoys us up in the layered distance of the mountains. The island offshore is no bigger than a big rock. There you find the bronze statue of the Discouri, standing a foot high in the open air of Pefnos. The sea sweeps over in winter and never moves them. A sparrow's two-toned chatter elevates the blue dome over Taitos and the gulf, the distance unimaginable. And to finish, the pleats of the sun And this again comes back to Lee, to Lee Harwood. We were in the air listening to the song about Icarus, holding the silver thread of morning like a tune. Turbulence flipped the flight attendant over on all fours. Icarus thought it funny until he touched the silver thread, fizzing in the air like a firework. His first and last sunrise, he saw a picture of the world turning and forgetting. The olive trees swayed as one, clapped their little hands. There's no conspiracy on earth, Eolus said, just gravity. But given what you know about human nature. We fell towards the sea, assumed the diving position, the blue and grey perfection suddenly less abstract. The captain sang the song about Icarus over and over. 
I sit in the last corner of courtyard sunlight, see the shadow plot diurnal, clouds resist quotation, drifting high across the shadowed mountains. We step, we talk, according to Homeric measure. It's a matter of time gone deep, uncounted. We've been inventing this song for generations. My neighbors gather in the olive groves and high meadows. Bodies passing seen in the intervals of leaves. I mean, they seem like drifting confetti of light. Nothing is more beautiful than this temporary coruscation. The refrain, the pause for thought, the contact made, it secures nothing but sings the epic of a shared breath. The roadside cafeneo is a stage set lit by, summer, by a summer morning. Old men sit off to the side in the shade for a first drink. Variously garlanded figures assemble. Working men before work pull up for a coffee and a smoke. The young women, made up, hair done, dress ready, run the place, tease and serve. The backdrop through the big windows behind the counter is a huge sweep of sea, fit to break your heart like a world of endless blue, endless promise. The men load up, come and go, the women attend and smile. Maria, you are as fresh as morning. What do you want, Petro? And tickles the palm of his extended hand. What I want is a break and you. Quotation translated from Zara by Lee Howard. The terrace is full of salty murmurs, the dress and even the pleats of the sun. The days are columns of light. Let them go in the unexplored grove to stand apparent in the open air. An unfixed cartography surrounds them. Those voyages unforgotten as bright shards scattered trace another coast after the submerged marble gardens comes the first smell of the land. Leaving the house uncaught, that moment of evening, the wind in the pine, the color shift of earth, bronze mountains, Lee, that moment you would know. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Fabulous. Thank you, whoever said that. <laughs> it's Elaine. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> it was absolutely wonderful. It was lovely, Kelvin. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. I'm bloody exhausted now. Yeah, fabulous <laughs> reading. <laughs> fabulous reading again, Kelvin. Um, thank you, thank you. Aidan, I think it's the first time I've heard you read. I think it is. I think it is. Thank you. Thank you for, for being here. Anyway, that, that is all, folks, really. In an ideal world, this would be the point that we could all mill about, buy or swap books, then adjourn to the <laughs> pub. Um, in this world, it really just remains for me to thank Maria Stadnitska, Kelvin Corcoran, for joining me to launch Molly Bloom's projected reading series. Um, my partner Penny for helping me set it up and for handling the technical side of things tonight and thank to the three wonderful publishers behind the books you've heard readings from so Alec Newman of Knife, Forks and Spoons for Maria Stadnitska's Somnia, John Thompson of Parlour Press for Kelvin Corcoran's The Republic of Song and Tony Fraser of Shearsman for my own they will be singing and thank you all for tuning in, logging on, listening, whatever. Um, so until the next time, good night and stay safe. Um, I have, it has been suggested to me that I'll keep this meeting open. Um, if you, anybody wants to hang around for a little while, um, unmute yourselves and chat. If you don't, thank you again and good night. <laughs>